Our old buddy, Rabbi Asher Mays, it's been a few years since we talked, man. How you doing? Good, good. How's it going? Going going well. Uh, so uh, what's, and for those who don't know our relationship, when I say buddy, we are obviously theological opponents, but we've, we've chatted a few times over the years. So, so what's up, sir? What's the purpose of your call? So I tried in a little late on the discussion, but I heard that you were discussing covenant. And I, I wanted to um, bring to light an earth-shaking idea that's typically not mentioned much in terms of the covenant between God and the world. And that's the notion of the mixed multitude. As many people say, and I know that you don't teach this, but that the Torah is only for the Jew or someone who's able to go through a halakhic conversion process, right? But just reading the words in the five books of Moses alone, any one of us could enter that covenant the same way the Hebrews and the mixed multitude entered that covenant on Mount Sinai. So the rabbis teach that on Mount Sinai, there actually stood more non-Hebrews than Hebrews, the mixed multitude. In Hebrew, they call it the Arab Rav, right? teaching that one doesn't need a prestigious pedigree to enter into an agreement with God of him being our God and us being his people, and thus be united in Torah. I, I'm not a Christian basher or Messianic basher, and those who've seen my videos can attest to that. I promote Torah and the observance of Torah, and I think that if Torah is what unites you, what ultimately can separate you? Right. Um, however, if someone feels that the Torah has been away with or it's not applicable in order to be in that covenant, that is already the makings of a new religion. So I promote Torah and Torah observance. Uh, and I know that there's a lot of rabbis who push this notion of the Noahide laws as some sort of alternative or viable alternative to Torah Judaism. But really, the Noid laws or the Noid movement is a reactionary movement because conversions have been politicized and it's really a disgrace what the rabbis are doing nowadays, right? However, if someone can't go through a halakhic conversion process, that shouldn't stop them from entering into that covenant with God, just like the Hebrews and the mixed multitude entered that covenant on Mount Sinai. All right, so, so, yeah, so let, let me ask you this. Um, you, you identify as an Orthodox Jew, is that correct? Correct. Oh, all right. So why is it then that if someone was going to, quote, convert today, so you'd say a Gentile converts to, to Torah Judaism, right? Why is it then that they would now be converting to a system that is led and dictated by Jewish rabbis and that you'd now be submitting to the tradition of Jewish rabbis? You know, why won't won't it then become elitist in the very way that you're saying it shouldn't be because it's more universal? Mm -hmm. Well, becoming part of Israel or entering that covenant is really a two step process. One is being validated by God, and that happens immediately once you realize that the God of Israel is true and His Torah is true. And then the second part of that is being liable to the punishments of the Great Court of the Sanhedrin. In other words. Being that there's a punishment for things like breaking Shabbat or karet for eating chametz on Pesach, there has to be checks and balances on how these laws are adjudicated. Right? Self-interpretation of Scripture was never encouraged throughout Israel. There was ultimately a court that determined ceremonial law, and converting to Judaism is only a legal process that made you subject to the rulings of this court. However, entering a covenant with God is between you and God. There's no one in between that. In other words, a mikvah is not going to in any way solidify that. So it's a two-step process. I know it's kind of hard to understand Judaism nowadays in exile, right? But Torah itself was given to a nation, and you can't run a nation by anyone, by everyone walking around with a Bible under their arm trying to decipher Scripture on their own. There had to be a consensus, a ruling body, deciding how do we keep Shabbat, how do we keep Yom Kippur, and how does one legally enter the nation of Israel. And that's what conversion became. Conversion doesn't appear in the Torah. Right? They said Nasev and Ishma, they took upon these laws, and they entered into that covenant. This is why if someone is not able to go to go through the halachic process of conversion, they could still enter the covenant the same way the mixed multitude in the Hebrews entered that covenant. Right, but bottom line, it, 
even with what you're teaching, they then come under the authority of the rabbis. They then come under the authority mm -hmm. of, of Talmud and Jewish tradition, so that even right. though you're saying they come in kind of equal standing, they've still got to do it the traditional Jewish way to be rightly following Scripture, in your view, correct? No, no. Not to be rightly to rightly follow Scripture. If you want to enter the physical nation of Israel, well, that nation is led by judges. Now, the role of the judge is an office that's never even spoke about or spoken about. People talk about the office of the king, the prophet, but the shofet, the judge, is one of the greatest offices in Israel. And Deuteronomy chapter 17, Deuteronomy chapter 1, Numbers chapter 22, solidifies the existence of the Sanhedrin, the group of elders of of 70 elders. 71 oh, tell you what, stay, stay right there. Stay right there. We'll just take another minute on the other side of the break to ask if we can legitimately get from Deuteronomy 17 and a national court adjudicating difficult cases from there to the authority of the Talmudic rabbis. We'll have that discussion when we come back. See, with some of the Jewish community, because of his advocating of Gentiles converting to Judaism, even in, in mass, he can correct that if he, he says I'm not saying it accurately. But uh, we're talking now about someone uh, joining the people of Israel and what that would mean. Obviously, we have some very strong differences on many, many points, in particular about Jesus the Messiah. But specifically here, traditional Jewish teaching would say that based on Deuteronomy 17, the rabbis have authority to tell Jewish people what time to get up in the morning, what prayers to pray, details like this that are not written in Scripture, whereas I see Deuteronomy 17 is just establishing kind of like the Supreme Court of ancient Israel. It's just the plain meaning of it to adjudicate certain difficult cases like homicide cases and things like that. So, uh, Rabbi Mesa, just back to you. First, do you interpret Deuteronomy 17 in a traditional Jewish way that this text uh, ultimately gives authority to the rabbis to do what they've done through the centuries, or do you have a different take on it? Uh, that's exactly how I interpret it. I don't like using the word rabbis, just because it's a much later idea, but the judge, it gives power to the judges. Okay. All right, so so explain this then. It gives power to the judges to adjudicate certain difficult cases that come up, right, like homicide or something like that, just like we have a, you know, circuit courts and, and then a Supreme Court. So this would be like the Supreme Court of Israel with the Levitical priests functioning as, as shoftim, as judges, in uh, in Jerusalem, how do you get from that to saying that if a traditional rabbi rules, that for example, it's it's breaking the law to open the refrigerator and a light goes on, that that's violating the Sabbath, that's actually violating the Sabbath, or that if uh, you don't say certain words in prayer at a certain time of the day, that you're in disobedience to the sages? How do you get from a Supreme Court? to giving the rabbis that kind of right, or the later Jewish authorities, that kind of right over, over Jewish people's lives. Mm -hmm. This is a difficult position for me, because I feel like I'm having to defend a lot of the mistakes that many rabbis make in trying to explain what the oral law is. Now, the authority of the judge comes through what's called smicha, which is ordination. It says that God was going to put on the elders, what he put on Moses. And this was passed down from teacher to student till it was eventually um, annulled, or it disappeared amongst Israel in around the fourth century of the Common Era. So these judges, not rabbis of today, these judges, those who specifically sat on the court, Deuteronomy chapter 17 introduces the notion of lo tasur, of not straying from the right or to the left of what they instruct. Now, because these guys are flesh and blood, they can't institute anything metaphysical, right? They could only teach on law. And like it says in Deuteronomy chapter 17, that in all areas of controversy, we're to heed their instructions. In other words, they're here to help, not hurt. Now, I know that many people, if they open up a Talmud or they open up any other book of rabbinic literature, they're going to find a lot of what's called Midrash and Agadah, which is folklore and legend things that have nothing to do with law. And worse, there's books of Kabbalah that get many times confused with oral law, that have silly notions on which shoe to put on first and you know stuff like that. This is not law. Law has to originate from the Mishnah, 
And the Mishnah and the Gemara make up the Talmud, and it had to be a ruling from this court. And these rulings are only practical. They're not metaphysical. The metaphysical always has to stem from Torah to be authoritative. But I'm sure you understand that a nation cannot function without these checks and balances. Because my children couldn't marry your children because you'd be keeping Shabbat differently than than my family is. There has to be a consensus. Right. Or a lot of the things that we look for in consensus weren't looked for back then. So, I mean, Deuteronomy 17, and I'll read the new JPS translation, so it's a respected Jewish translation. If a case is too baffling for you to decide, be it a controversy over homicide, civil law, or assault, matters of dispute in your courts, you shall promptly repair to the place that the Lord your God will have chosen. Nowhere did it say that they could legislate all the things that they legislate. Nowhere does it say they could add a, a, a new traditions and things like that. You know, even wearing a yarmulke, where'd that come from? It's got nothing to do with scripture. It's, it's not even Mishnaic. That's not or, a law. Right, right. That's I not a law. That's a custom. It's, it's a custom. Right. But then things get merged together where customs become laws and the custom of the people becomes law, et cetera. Uh, and, and the idea that they had the authority to, you know, to, to institute, uh, you know, because they wrote certain prohibitions. And if it's from the sages, then it would have a certain binding power. Or, or here— when when you say, for example, I'm not sure if you pray the traditional prayer, your wife at Shabbat, you know, if your wife prays the traditional mm-hmm. prayer, that, you know, but Sivan uh uh I was praying Hanukkah, but that, that he's right. commanded us to kindle the light. Of a candle. Right. So where does God command that? He doesn't. It's not a command. Okay. That's, a, that's a later tradition. Okay. So, so that, what I'm saying is you're talking about people coming under a covenant, but then what I'm hearing is you have to become a traditional Jew and submit to the authority of the rabbis, but the authority of the rabbis is not based on Scripture. Mm-hmm. So, reiterating what appears in Deuteronomy chapter 17 is Second Chronicles chapter, uh, chapter 19, verse 8, and it pretty much repeats Deuteronomy chapter 17 word for word, and here it says, and Whensoever any controversy shall come to you from your brethren that dwell in the cities between blood and blood, right? That we read that before. And then it says between law and commandment, statutes and ordinances. In other words, between the commandments and the Torah, how do we keep these laws? There had to be a ruling body. Now, yes, there's a gross misrepresentation of oral law today in Jewish life, okay? Because they make no distinction between Torah law and rabbinic law. We have a principle in Judaism. That if there is a question on a rabbinic law, we're commanded to be lenient. But suffix the right to lahumra. If there's a question on a Torah law, we're commanded to be commanded to be strict. Right, right. The rabbis of the Talmud went out of the way to make a distinction between rabbinic law and Torah law. They're amplifying for it, not rewriting or adding to it, because their laws are called rabbinic, not Torah. That's what people fail to understand. Right, but I mean, you, you also you problem. also have the teachings that that the words of the sages are, are more important and binding. Without that, you can't understand the written Torah. It's I mean, you, you know all those, right? But I'm still saying the they're, they're Talmudic dictums. But bottom line, though, so God did not command, God did not command the lighting of the Sabbath candles. You agree with that? Correct, absolutely. All right, so As then you should you the shouldn't pray that prayer. Answers then. your question. You, you, I'm not happy with the way. The rabbis formulated that that bracha, and the Rambam, well, and the Rambam wasn't either. He gives us a response. Why does it say, "Asher Tivanu"? Right? That God never commanded us to light Shabbat candles. He says this is the Rambam's response that He did command us to listen to the judges that they instituted it. And Deuteronomy chapter 17 says that by listening to them, you'd be listening to me. Now. God expects you to be more of a scholar to figure this out. The average person knows that there's no law in the Torah to light candles. Right. It's a rabbinic command, and right. rabbinic Judaism understands it like a rabbinic command. But yes, you're right. I really wish it was phrased differently. But, but I don't but think the see, even, even, yeah, even scholar what, would stumble on that. Even what, but it's not the average scholar. It's the average person doing it. And, and I okay, know full fine. well, having interacted with the traditional community for 48 years— that the problem is that things get merged together. And if, you know, look, I talked to one traditional Jew once. I said, look, just for one day, don't pray the traditional prayers and just talk to God from your heart. God forbid 
But but it's nowhere in Scripture. So you say, yeah, but I'm not to depart from the left or right. Or if they say go left, if they say left is right, then I have to believe them because the you know as 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 uh, Ramban says, you know that the spirit that was on the prophets is on them. So because of this, you now have this mixture. So hey, listen, we've just got a minute, but your position mm-hmm. cannot make you popular among Orthodox rabbis. Am I correct? As a matter of fact, there's a very large community, not in America, mainly in Israel, amongst Yemenite Jews that go mainly by the Rambam's understanding of Judaism. The Rambam's understanding predated Kabbalah, and it's really Kabbalistic Judaism that you're responding to. Those who make no distinction between rabbinic law and Torah law. But the Sheva Mitzvot, the seven, rabbinic command. seven Commandments is huh? not Kabbalistic. I mean, that's, that's pretty early, right? Oh, I don't have a problem with the seven laws. The seven laws no, no, are a no, set of laws developed by the court to adjudicate Gentiles living No, 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 not the seven laws of Noah, the Sheva Mitzvot, the the seven rabbinic uh, commandments, which include the lighting of... Oh, all right. But but anyway, listen... that in itself is a medrash. Okay. Okay, got it. Anyway, listen, we're out of time, but I appreciate you you calling in and uh, interacting and maybe... uh, where, Where are you living these days? South Florida. South Florida. All right, well... God willing, I'm in Jacksonville a few weeks. It's getting close there. All right. Be well, sir. Can I plug and, uh, in my website? Is that okay with you? Yeah. As long as folks, do, because we had this friendly discussion. So we are sure. theological yeah. opponents, friends, when it comes to who who Jesus is and, and my insisting that there's no salvation outside of him for Jew or Gentile. So understanding that, yes, please go ahead. Give your website. TorahJudaism.com. And my name is Rabbi Asher Meza. And I encourage everyone to consider becoming Israel through conversion. Got it. All right. Thank you for the call, sir. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. All right. And, of course, my response, being at my show, is the way that you come into right relationship with God is not by a Gentile becoming part of physical Israel or coming under the Sinai Covenant, but coming to God through the Messiah who shed his blood for us and is the ultimate perfect sacrifice who declares us righteous and empowers us to live new and righteous lives. And then Jew and Gentile, without the Jew becoming a Gentile, the Gentile becoming a Jew, the two become one, equal brothers and sisters in the Messiah.